Thank you. Good morning, everybody. A smaller but perfectly formed audience today for the uh, early morning, last day of the conference session. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Chris Harty from the School of Construction Management and Engineering at the University of Reading uh, in the UK. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to get asked to uh, come and give, uh, hopefully, the first of May uh, ARCOM uh, keynotes. Um, here at this uh, conference, I think it's wonderful to have uh, the kind of three uh, institutions uh, together sharing. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, think about returning the favour uh, at an ARCOM conference soon. Um, so a little bit about me, I am uh, not really a construction person. I'm weird like case, but in a different way. I'm a sociologist by background. And uh, more specifically, um, I've always worked in the area of what's sometimes called science and technology studies um, or social technical systems, uh, studies of how technologies are developed and shaped uh, and how um, organisations and use of technologies shape uh, emerging technologies and also how those technologies shape organisational processes. And I kind of started off in this uh, area, um, having this interest in sort of collaborative IT systems and what they do to organisations, and ended up uh, doing PhD work looking at implementing collaborative design tools on the UK uh, Heathrow Terminal 5 project some years ago. Uh, and then sort of by accident, almost stayed in construction as a sort of empirical space, stayed in kind of construction management as uh, my kind of academic uh, home, if you like. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some of the research I've been doing on BIM. Uh, and in fact, I was doing research on BIM before it was called BIM, so it goes back some uh, time. But I'm going to concentrate on some more recent uh, projects and try to give you a little sense of uh, perhaps where the UK is in terms of uh, and kind of BIM use, BIM implementation, ideas around uh, what BIM is doing to the construction sector. So I'm going to start off, I'm just going to say a few words about ARCOM for those of you that don't know uh, ARCOM as a sort of uh, association. Uh, but then I want to talk about uh, our UK government's sort of BIM agenda, BIM mandate. And we have this sort of thing that's uh, around rolling out BIM across uh, the construction sector in the UK. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a kind of survey we did of a very big UK contractor on sort of BIM use and awareness. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of case studies of the use of uh, BIM-type technologies uh, on, uh, uh, on real projects, real live projects. Um, all of this stuff is uh, grounded in uh, engaging with uh, industry. And if there's a, a kind of theme to the talk, the theme is this idea around spinning off and scaling up. Uh, and I'll come back to what I mean by that uh, as we go through the talk. So very quickly, for those of you that don't know, ARCOM uh, is an association of researchers in construction, uh, in construction management. Uh, we turned 30 last year, and we're going for quite some time. Uh, we have a conference every year in early September. It's always in the UK, but it's probably 30 or so percent international, 70 percent kind of UK-based academics and PhD students. Um, we also have a programme of seminars that are organised throughout the year. Some of these are sort of PhD kind of workshops, uh, others are more about supporting early and mid-career academics. Um, and in fact, we have an outcome sponsored workshop at the front of the EPOC conference in a couple of weeks' time in Edinburgh. For the last couple of years, on the back of our annual conference, we've ended up producing a special issue in the journal Construction Management uh, and Economics, uh, which I'm one of the uh, editors. Um, and we have something like 150, 200, it's quite hard to count, uh, individual members um, and about 15 institutional members, uh, most of which are in the, K, in the UK, but some in, uh, in Scandinavia as well. So uh, ARCOM is a very friendly conference, just like this one. Anybody who would be interested in coming to the UK, we would be happy to see, uh, to see you there. Uh, and indeed, I guess some of you have uh, perhaps been uh, in the past. So that's ARCOM, uh, let's move on to BIM. BIM is the answer to everything and uh, is all things these days and uh, uh, quite a large proportion of this conference and I'm guessing the ARCOM conference and the EPOC conference will be sort of BIM papers. And 
So I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about the policy landscape in, 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 the, in the UK. Um, we had this announcement in 2011 that the government was going to effectively mandate the use of BIM on, uh, on their sort of public projects from 2016, from next year. Uh, this requirement for collaborative 3D BIM with all projects and asset information documentation being electronic. Okay, so we have this sort of uh, government sort of shove um, for the sector in the UK to start to use BIM. Um, why are they doing it? Well, uh, I'm not so familiar with the sort of uh, North American construction sectors, but certainly in the UK and other countries, there's a long history of the government trying to kick it as hard as it can to get better and quicker and cheaper. And we've had uh, all sorts of government reports and government-backed kind of reports about how uh, the sector should learn from other sectors like aerospace, how it should use uh, IT better, how it should be more innovative, and so on and so forth. So there's a backdrop of uh, this idea of um, the government helping the sector by giving it this sort of shove, yeah, and making it sort of do uh, something a bit different. Um, there are also some uh, particular reasons. Uh, the mandate is a strong emphasis on sort of asset management handover. Um, there's a strong emphasis on the construction sector providing not just the keys to the building, but uh, some information that helps make the operation of that building or that sort of uh, portfolio of assets uh, easier uh, and better. And they were very keen to sort of make this, uh, in terms of what the government were telling the sector to do, make it kind of quite like to leave the sector to sort out itself kind of what, how it was going to um, approach these things. So we have this idea of non-proprietary, general, open, compliant kind of technologies rather than present a technological solution that everybody should use. And lots and lots of people have been involved in this sort of BIM task group and the stuff around the, the, the BIM task groups in the UK. One of them is sitting at the back of the room there, my colleague uh, Jennifer White, who spoke yesterday, um, sort of just trying to work out uh, quite how to make this happen. And uh, we have this idea in the UK about these different levels of kind of maturity, if you like, in terms of the use of information and kind of IT in construction projects. I don't know how often this surfaces in a Canadian or US kind of context, but you can't go to any kind of BIM event, any kind of BIM discussion without seeing the Bue and Richards BIM wedge. Uh, what do we have above us here? And uh, that's effectively trying to show how we're moving through levels of sophistication in terms of coordination of information uh, over time. And our government mandate is about delivering BIM level two by 2016. And uh, I guess you can sort of read up there the sort of idea of managed, uh, managed 3D environment, perhaps with separate BIM tools uh, with uh, various types of uh, data attached and somehow bringing all these together and sort of coordinating the information. But of course a government push, a big initiative like this also gets people talking uh, about what this means for the sector and uh, again in a UK context uh, there's been an awful lot of what I've been calling sort of BIM evangelism kind of going on. Rhetoric around how BIM is the new panacea, the new magic bullet that's going to solve all of those long-standing issues in construction around coordination, collaboration, uh, and the kind of inefficiencies in the system. It's the new lean, yeah, it's the new TQM, it's the new partnering, it's the kind of new thing. And um, what I think is interesting about that is, is, and I might come back to this, is how a lot of the hand-waving is somewhat further along the line than what the government mandate's actually asking for. Um, it wants level two, not this level three, not this fully open, fully integrated, fully almost sort of compliant process. It's asking for a rather more modest uh, and hence hopefully more achievable sort of target. Um, well, I've talked about this before. Uh, this slide uh, actually didn't say one about level three. It was sort of saying how in the documentation around the, the BIM mandate, level three is kind of you know, the, the ultimate kind of open, collaborative, um, you know, sort of perfect system that uh, wasn't actually really mentioned very much in, in the documentation, it wasn't there much at all. And so you had this rhetoric on the one hand about, you know, this industry which is fully integrated, 
uh, fully kind of compliant, very sophisticated across the process, but the use of these technologies, uh, but actually a kind of uh, a policy goal that was slightly more modest. But now we have, since February, this uh, idea of level three, moving towards level three as we move uh, beyond 2016. And uh, nice for, for me anyway, um, there's quite a lot of discussion in that around the kind of cultural uh, changes, the behavioural changes, the reconfigurations that are actually required if you're going to do uh, BIM as this sort of joined up process across complex projects with multiple uh, organisations. So the level three discussion is sort of now starting to happen at policy level as well as uh, the kind of kind of magic bullet discussions that have been uh, sort of going on. So that's the kind of context. We have this mandate. We have now this uh, uh, discussion. We've moved in, in the policy circles to say, well, you know, level two is a thing that's starting to happen. Now we can start to think about level three, about this sort of more uh, open and integrated kind of way of uh, using BIM. Um, lots of discussions about this in, in, in the construction sector in the UK, as there are elsewhere. Um, and within that kind of context, um, but myself and some of the um, uh, research team I work with uh, have been doing lots of different kind of research around uh, the implementation of BIM. Uh, the stuff we do isn't really so much about technology development, it's more about, as I was saying at the beginning, following kind of these technologies, looking at how they're shaped, looking at how they come into practice, looking at the impact that the technologies have on practice, but also what impact practices have on shaping technology. So is there, is there anything that makes this kind of body of research, of which some of which I'm going to talk about uh, for the next sort of uh, 20 or 30 minutes or so, um, it's this sort of social technical focus on this uh, connectivity between people, process uh, and, and, and technologies. So, as I said at the beginning, a few projects I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, this uh, BIM sort of use and awareness survey that we conducted sort of, uh, I guess, three years ago now. I'm going to look at uh, some of the case study work we've done following the development and implementation of BIM practices and technologies on some projects, uh, particular healthcare uh, focus. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some uh, kind of emerging uses and applications that are going on that we've been sort of following and studying. And again, this idea of scaling up and spinning off, um, which again, I'll come back to. Uh, so um, one of the uh, larger contractors in the UK, or at least it's a global uh, international company with a large UK um, uh, presence, um, had gone through a program of uh, trying to make everybody in the company aware of BIM and try to get them doing BIM on projects. Yeah. And so they came to us to ask if we would do some kind of survey to find out what kind of uh, impact uh, this had had. Uh, this had had. Um, just to find out what people thought, what people's attitudes were towards uh, uh, BIM in the company. Um, and I think at the time, uh, maybe still, um, it was one of the biggest sort of BIM surveys that's been done. This uh, survey went out to all four and a half, five thousand employees. It's quite interesting that it becomes quite difficult to actually count how many employees there are in a large business. We couldn't quite get them to work out exactly how many people uh, they employed. Um, but it sort of went to everybody that was sort of registered sort of uh, user on the IT system. And so that went from you know, very senior managers right the way down to kind of people working in admin and secretarial uh, roles. It didn't quite go as far as the cleaners, I don't think, but it went to everybody. Uh, and so we wanted to find out about this sort of uh, level of awareness, and we wanted to kind of find out about people's attitudes towards uh, BIM. Um, they were quite keen to know how successful this sort of program had been. They were quite keen to be developing further their sort of implementation strategy in the, in, in, in the company. Um, they wanted to sort of support their business case for asking uh, the top guys for some more money and help to, to, to get BIM uh, rolling out across projects uh, and, and, and so on. Um, and as is often the case in big complex organisations, nobody quite knows what everybody else is doing and nobody quite knows what people uh, think. Uh, so, so we said we'd do this survey and um, it had some fairly standard questions on it. It had a, 
uh, different routes through the survey depending on the answer to the question of, you know, have you heard of BIM? And then if it said no, then it went straight to the end. And if it said yes, it was about how much do you know about BIM? And there were different types of questions depending on whether people considered themselves to know a little bit uh, or, or a lot uh, about BIM. But we also used uh, these uh, sort of standard set of questions about uh, sort of technology acceptance. So the kind of technology acceptance model is a fairly well rehearsed thing that's been around for many years in the information systems world. Uh, it, like all these sort of things, is a very well critiqued uh, uh, kind of uh, conceptual framework as well. But uh, we decided to use something that had some kind of purchase that had been rehearsed many times that had been done uh, quite a lot just to help us structure this sort of set of uh, ideas around, um, uh, around sort of awareness and attitudes really. It was also quite unusual for me to do a survey. It's the first time I've really done anything much with numbers. I've always been uh, much more sort of uh, words and observation stuff. So I'll quickly talk through some of the uh, results, um, which were kind of quite interesting. Uh, have you heard of BIM? Uh, well, 84% of the respondents, something like uh, 1,300 respondents, uh, just under, uh, completed the survey. 84% um, uh, had heard of BIM. And like I say, this went to everybody in the organisation that had an email account, effectively. Uh, so it wasn't just operational, cold face uh, type stuff. Have you used BIM? Well, just over 20, you know, about 24% said they used it. But the telling figure is, are you currently using BIM? I said this is three years ago the survey was done. 16% um, said they were using BIM. So we have a big gap between awareness uh, and actually what people are doing. Um, in terms of the sort of opinions and attitudes and stuff, again using these sort of standardised, largely standardised sort of uh, questions from, the, from this TAM kind of approach. Um, uh, well, what do people think? Uh, I don't know if you can read that very well, but these are questions about things like, uh, you know, BIM will enhance my effectiveness in my role, and, you know, a, a like it type uh, set of responses. Um, so the uh, uh, top left one uh, says, using BIM tools should enhance uh, my effectiveness in my role, and the big columns are agree and strongly agree. So people thought that it would help them in their jobs. Uh, the next one along, my line manager would help me, uh, support me. Again, uh, it's the sort of agree and strongly agree that are sort of dominant there. Um, what else have we got here? Working in a BIM way would be complicated and time consuming. Uh, bottom left, uh, most people said no, they disagreed with that or strongly disagreed with that. They thought it wouldn't be overly complicated, it wouldn't be overly uh, challenging. And then guidance would be available. Uh, for me in the selection of BIM tools, and again, most people uh, agreed. So we have a strong sense of um, people being willing to use it, people being positive about BIM um, in this company. If the choice were to me, I would use BIM a lot. That's what people were saying. Yeah, and if I was working on a project that used BIM, I would personally wish to use it as much as possible. That's what people were saying in this kind of survey. I won't dwell on this one, this was just sort of a list of what do you think, but this, this went to the people that said they knew a lot about BIM in the survey, and as you can see from there, there was over 400 of those uh, uh, kind of self-reported BIM experts. Um, uh, but what's interesting is at the top, we've got sort of fewer uh, errors and quality stuff. So the kind of classic idea of BIM is coordination, spatial coordination, clash, a detection. And then the sort of lower numbers are you know, lower project management costs and lower design costs. So we can sort of infer a bit from that that, you know, many people are still sort of thinking in that BIM equals a kind of uh, coordination, clash, uh, detection sort of uh, activity. Uh, what do we take away from this? I mean, this was just uh, a chance, really, but 84% was the magic number of both people that would either definitely or probably want to use BIM if the choice was up to them, but also the percentage of people that weren't using BIM in the company. It was just luck that it worked out like that. But, and I think more generally, 
people in the company and the people in general have this uh, idea that uh, you know you learn about something, you become aware about a, a technology. If you then feel positive about that, you don't think it's threatening or complex or going to you know take you out of a job. You want to use it, then it leads to use. And what our survey kind of was showing that yeah, people know about it, people feel positive about it, but it was showing that people weren't really using it. I think the company knew this, but they sort of still act surprised, really, we weren't sure about that. And so uh, the thing this sort of presents, as well as being very interesting in terms of the awareness and attitudes towards BIM and some of the stuff around perceived benefits and, and so on, it kind of tells us something about this model of learn about something, want to, want to do it, you know, as a person want to do it, and actually then using it. There's something else that has to happen, or some other things rather than one thing that is required to kind of start to support, to convert this sort of awareness and positive attitude into actual use of these uh, tools, processes, and technologies. And of course, that's what we told the company, and we told them, you know, pay us some money and we can help them with that. But the kind of resourcing around these things, this idea that automatically, you know, if people want to use it, they'll pick it up and they'll use it. There are other things organisationally uh, within projects and companies that are obviously sort of not leading to that sort of direct link. Uh, that was about challenging that assumption about the technology's there, people want to use it, so people will use it. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, I'm going to talk about some uh, case study work that's sort of still ongoing. It's been going on for some uh, years, in fact, um, around uh, building hospitals uh, using sort of BIM uh, technologies. Um, up until the end of uh, last year, uh, I had uh, a, a government funded, uh, research council funded uh, research centre on healthcare infrastructure innovation. And we did all sorts of things within that centre, but one of the things we were looking at is uh, looking at the kind of delivery and construction of, of, of hospital projects through uh, these kind of uh, BIM type technology and processes. So this is a case study of two very big hospitals in central London, uh, the Barts and the London. There's two hospitals together because uh, they're run by the same sort of trusts, the same operating organisation. Um, and uh, they're big projects. Um, so in the UK, you've got it split roughly a billion pounds split between uh, the Barts and uh, the London. Um, quite a lot of the Barts stuff was refurbishment and some new stuff. Part of the building was sort of under preservation orders, so they couldn't do stuff with it. Uh, lots of the London was actually new build work. Um, and there's some facts and things there, but I mean, one of the interesting things uh, here is there are 7,500 rooms being built across these two hospitals. Hospitals are complex buildings anyway, uh, but these are big, complicated, difficult. I think, uh, I keep forgetting to look up the figure, but it was something like uh, 50,000 kilometres of skirting across the across the projects, but there's a huge complex things to uh, organise, and I'm sure you uh, are aware of this. Um, so what we did is we've done two parts of a three-part or a longitudinal study. The first thing we did is uh, we went and we tried to work out how they made the decision to use BIM for this particular project. This is outside of the mandate. This was project starting in terms of detailed design, probably 2000. Eight or so, uh, they decided to use BIM to do the coordination. We wanted to kind of find out uh, why that was, look at how this was set up in the kind of design phase. Then we did a second phase of data collection uh, once <coughs> everything was sort of handed over to the contractor and on site work started. So we wanted to look at how they were carrying on, carrying through these sort of BIM tools and processes into, into the construction phase. And we're still yet to do uh, the last bit, which will be to look at what we're going to do with it in terms of operation. This was a PFI, you know, a UK PPP uh, project. And so what that means is, as well as uh, the joint venture uh, contractor and, 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 and uh, architect, 
as well as uh, building, delivering a building and handing over the keys, they have a concession to operate and maintain the building for 35 years, in this case, after it opens. So they start to care about operation. That's one of the things that PFI did in the UK. It made people uh, care about how easy or efficient these buildings are going to be to, to, to carry run because they either are going to have to look after them themselves or try to sell on the concession uh, to operate after it's complete. Anyway, so, so uh, we, one of the interesting things is when you try to find out what happened and why they used BIM, you get all sorts of different answers. Different people claim to have been the linchpin in making the decision. So the, the, the main design manager in the contracting organisation said he was brought into this project, it was a complete mess, it's really complicated, nobody had a clue what was going on. I asked some people, how are we going to get a handle on this? And some, you know, young guy over there said, let's do BIM, and we said, right, okay, let's give it a go. The architect uh, would, would, would tell us that we do everything in BIM anyway, that's why it's done, and you know, we were doing it, and so the contractor uh, and the rest of the supply chain followed us. So you, you always get different answers, different claims about where it came from. But we also asked people what they thought BIM was. And it's interesting, and it's an interesting thing about BIM when we have conversations about BIM and discussions in, in the industry, that often people are talking about quite different things or have quite different interpretations of BIM and what it is and what it does. Um, I guess as more and more work is done around uh, kind of standards and data exchange formats and processes and so on, we start to get maybe a little more certainty. Um, but this is what we're getting here from, uh, from, from the kind of interviews and discussions we were having. Um, and we start at the top, you know, BIM is 3D coordinated design models. Yeah, it's spatial coordination across different disciplines. Uh, then we move to, uh, no, it's not just kind of coordination, it's, it's a package or a library of data and intelligent uh, uh, objects. It's not just coordination, it's got all this other extra stuff that helps us, you know, design, build, operate uh, uh, this facility through this sort of model. Uh, then we move away from it being a thing to being a kind of process. It's a mechanism to generate coordinated data. Um, then slightly broader again, it's a way to deliver the right information at the right time. It's a tool with which to get stuff to the right people so they can do their uh, work, perform their activities as, as efficiently and, and, and uh, to the highest quality possible. The, the, the second but last one uh, is interesting. Uh, it's a way of controlling the quality of information. I'm not going to talk about it too much here, but um, there was a strong, strong sense of, of uh, construction project managers seeing these tools as a way to effectively uh, beat up the supply chain and put pressure on the kind of uh, the sub subcontracting uh, organisations. It was a way of having better information about what they were and weren't doing. And then right at the end we get to the sort of the broadest sort of hand waving definition. You know, BIM is not about CAD, it's not about coordination, it's not about uh, information, it's not a methodology of having documentation. It's a business strategy. Yeah, it's a new way of doing design, construction and operation. And I think one of the interesting things about these discussions that we might have about BIM is, you know, it's all of these things perhaps, and it's different things to different people. And we're talking about BIM, but we might actually not be talking about the same thing. But this sort of escalation in, in kind of ambition around uh, what BIM is and what it can do, right the way to it's a whole new way of working. This is kind of quite interesting. Uh, I'll talk very quickly through some of the things that we're doing. Um, in the design phase, uh, so they were doing sort of virtual briefing sessions and snagging in terms of sort of design coordination. Uh, fairly kind of uh, obvious and sensible thing to do when you've got these kind of models. Uh, they were doing clash detection, but they didn't want to call it clash detection. Yeah, and they said to me, if you call it clash detection, if you're finding clashes, there's something wrong. There shouldn't be any clashes. We should be able to coordinate all of the different bits of the design and we shouldn't have to have clashes. And so actually our process is about clash prevention. It's a sort of slightly different uh, 
way of thinking about it. The process, more or less, the same. You can see that you know, the, the, the pipe work they're going through the uh, steel beam. They used it for early safety reviews and in fact tried to bring sort of FM into the kind of early design discussions around the uh, layout of plant rooms, you know, picking up any kind of concerns around uh, placement, around getting the experts in to um, make uh, these sort of complex areas as workable as possible. Of course, it's also led to some more interesting conversations about, okay, so if we get FM in now, and then we change some things because they recommend that we do, and if that then causes a problem on site in five years' time when we're uh, installing the stuff, who carries the can? You know, do we act on getting the, uh, uh, the FM people involved earlier, you know, or do we do it in the way that we normally do and keep the kind of uh, risk profile and accountability and responsibility uh, that we're used to? Uh, and then we're doing some material takeoff, which was a little bit lumpy, but certainly for some, for some things it, uh, uh, they claimed it worked kind of pretty well. Uh, dry lining, for instance, they reckoned they were uh, about 10 times as accurate as, as, as the uh, estimators as, as, uh, that they had involved. Uh, this is kind of, um, you know, we recognise these sorts of things. Um, when we started to get towards construction, uh, then they started to do some uh, kind of certainly at the time, sort of two or three years ago, a bit more sort of novel stuff. Um, I mean, the construction planning things, I think it's been talked about a little bit at this conference. This idea that you know you have your schedule alongside the uh, alongside the model um, uh, to do your planning. But what they were also doing is they were using this as a tool to uh, uh, compare at a high level uh, the schedule with actual progress. So they had the model running over time uh, side by side, real progress on site. Uh, and what the schedule was supposed to be. And they found that, especially at sort of, you know, sort of city management, sort of uh, project management, a very useful tool to see what was behind and in front uh, in terms of the schedule. Um, plant equipment and installation, this was kind of interesting. In a hospital, the, the uh, MRI scanners turn up six weeks before the hospital opens, the hospital will open next year. But they're doing this five years earlier. Uh, and so somebody had this idea, we've got this model, we've got this installation model, um, let's see if the scanners are actually going to get through the building when it's finished into where they're going to live. And so they basically uh, uh, asked what size box did the scanner come in and then they tried to push it through the model or the set of scanners. And this is quite interesting, in one case they found 87 different clashes, some of which involved you know, knocking down walls, to get the thing around corners, and so they were able to uh, readjust the schedule towards the end of the project to make sure that they could get the stuff in. Um, and they reckon that saved them hundreds of thousands at least in terms of, in terms of the, the difficulties of their rework, and obviously that kind of thing could delay opening the hospital if it's uh, uh, so soon before. Um, so that was sort of stuff that we're doing kind of in the site office. Um, then somebody had the idea, um, and quite literally somebody had the idea about can we shove all this stuff onto a tablet PC and actually take it onto the site. So the first idea was really around drawing retrieval. They had uh, the model and they had a database sitting underneath it that had all the kind of, uh, all, all the associated kind of uh, object data and, and, and drawings and all the rest of it. Uh, and so rather than having to remember which uh, kind of paperwork to take with you to go and talk to the uh, site foreman, you know, going up on the bucket list, lift to the 15th floor, takes you 20 minutes to get there, you've forgotten the drawing that you're supposed to take, you've got it on your tablet PC. You've also got all the correspondence, all the emails, you know, all the kind of uh, uh, details about who's supposed to be and what when. Uh, and so they started to uh, use that, they started to give those to all the sort of uh, project managers on the site. And then they thought, if we've got the ability to take this stuff from tablet PCs, I wonder if we can do some sort of progress monitoring and, and kind of checking using this. So they got the database developer to come in uh, and add some functionality to the database that allowed them to use the tablet PC to um, check off completions or uh, percentage completions for various things. For, for a standard room in the hospital, there was something like uh, 80 different things that needed to be checked off in terms of handing over the rooms as compliant, so you know, finishes and flooring and plug sockets in the right place and so on and so forth. Even just doing that, they reckon for each room they saved about 
12 sheets of A3 paper and lots of ticks on them, they did it all on the, on the tablet PC. So these were all little incremental things they were doing that was helping them to sort of uh, just save bits and pieces here and there, and there we have someone playing with the tablet. So, I mean, interesting stuff, watching how this uh, set of practices was sort of being developed over time on this, by quite a small group of people on what's, what's a very big project. But I think what's interesting about this is these were things that emerged out of using the technology. A decision was made that we had the stuff to do some design coordination up front, and then it was a case of what can we do with it. There was no technology strategy, there was no kind of plan, there was no requirements. All of the people involved talked about this all working around a gentleman's agreement. They got together, said, let's give it a go, see what we can do with it. No contractual obligations, you know, no, nothing like that. And these ways of using were emerging from playing with uh, the technology, seeing what they could leverage from what they had. And I mean, this quote here, basically, the contractor thought they were going to do the class detection, yeah, sort all that stuff out, and then throw the data in the bin, and we're going to just scrap it. And then thought, well, actually, there's probably some things we can do with this. And this is where some of those other sort of applications kind of came from. Um, it also shows how these things uh, can start to scale up. We start with a very small number of tablet PCs, then all of a sudden there were, there were many, many more. Uh, we start with things happening, a group of kind of people doing it, as they described, under the radar. Uh, it wasn't to start off with official kind of uh, endorsed uh, project work. Um, and then as it gets bigger and it gets not sort of recognised, then it starts to uh, kind of um, be noticed by more people. Yeah. And it starts to, in this case, you know, start to, start to run up against uh, uh, the, the IT support in the company. This is all happening at the project. And then once it gets bigger, IT support centrally come in and say, oh, hang on a minute, is this sort of software they're using, is it authorised? I have a quote there that says something about, you know, it takes ages to get anything set up, anything approved. So when it was small, it was under the radar, when it started to get recognised as useful and, 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 and successful and worth trying to scale up, worth trying to grow, more tensions kind of uh, are revealed like between central IT support and, and project level uh, technologies. And indeed, uh, in many companies that I speak to, this is currently a point of debate. You know, as BIM is seen as more powerful, more central to the process, much more kind of, you know, information uh, driven, um, who is in charge of it? Should it be something that's pulled into the central IT functions of these big organisations, or is it something that should be you know, positioned in our projects. And of course, there's a power struggle here. The people that are in charge of BIM, you know, have uh, legitimacy and power that perhaps, when it was just CAD, didn't have. And so IT support want to have this, they want to own this kind of stuff. So we have this uh, idea that actually these sort of uh, applications, these uses, these uh, things are emerging through practice and it's not just the new ways of using that are uh, emerging, they're also tailoring and shaping the technology to, to, to do that, they're getting people in to do things, they're using it, they're appropriating it in different ways. Uh, but that does then come into attention with, as you try to grow, you know, how many projects, how many people are using this stuff. But the last thing I want to talk about uh, is something that if you like, it's a little bit of a spin-off from the kind of, you know, the, the, the BIM stuff. Uh, it's about exploring kind of collaboration in cave environments. Uh, cave, uh, you're probably familiar with these sort of immersive virtual reality kind of facilities. We have one at Reading. Um, uh, and so this is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of work we did around, uh, around that. Um, so just for those that don't know, sort of room-sized, lots of projectors, probably kind of, uh, the, the, the head tracker and, and the glasses on, and you feel like you're immersed in that kind of space, one to one kind of scale. Um, and we're having this conversation tonight. This is old technology, in fact. It's old technology, this stuff's been around for a long time. It's getting better and cheaper, but it's, but it's been around for a long time. 
but the, the sort of increased use, development of 3D models in the kind of design process has meant that there's now more interest in this kind of stuff because people are making the kind of 3D models anyway for you know, everyday business and it's relatively straightforward to get them into the source of emerging environments. And, um, I don't know if it's the same over here, but many companies now in the UK have gone out and bought Oculus Rift headsets and try to play with these things to see what kind of benefits they can get out of them, uh, porting kind of you know, Reddit or CAD models or, or BIM models into, uh, into sort of gaming engines for, for, for display. Uh, this was about really about um, client requirements. Uh, so a company came to me and said they were bidding for a new hospital in the UK. The hospital had to be all single room only accommodation, no kind of war, war style rooms. Um, uh, they had a requirement from the NHS Trust that was commissioning this that because it was single rooms, you had to have 60% visibility from the nursing stations in the corridor. So you have to be able to, it wasn't quite clear which 60% of the room or the patient or which end of the patient or anything, but there was this hard requirement that you have to get 60% visibility. And so that meant in terms of how the single rooms were designed, uh, where the nursing stations went and so on uh, was kind of important. There was also an issue around the size of each single room. There's no, there's guidance, but there's no kind of requirement for a single room in the UK to be a certain uh, number of square metres or square feet. Uh, but the, uh, the client, the trust, wanted to make sure that this um, uh, was, you know, kind of fit for purpose. And uh, this uh, JV architect and, and, and uh, consultant, uh, uh, contractor, sorry, uh, came to me and said, uh, "You showed us your cave thing a couple of years ago, and we weren't very interested in it, but we're interested in it now because we've got to demonstrate the size of the room and visibility to the client." And the only way we can think about doing that, other than using this sort of technology, is to build a physical mock-up. And they reckon the physical mock-up would cost, you know, 100, 150,000, not very flexible, um, to bring the trust around and, and, and kind of show them this stuff. And uh, they said, do you reckon you could do it with your snazzy, immersive virtual reality environment if we give you some kind of Revit type models? And of course we said, yes, we can do that. Uh, and we then had the idea that we could, we could uh, use that to sort of collect some data around how sort of design teams were uh, interacting and working within the immersive environments on a real life project, you know, real stuff that kind of matters. And so uh, we basically videotaped and had a, a couple of researchers at each of these sort of sessions. There was about 12 hours worth of uh, design review type work before the final event when the trust came round and, and, and looked at the model. And uh, so this is about being enabling a kind of different sort of set of processes around using this immersive uh, reality, but then also us being able to look at that and think, well, what kind of impact is it, ha is it having? What kind of difference is this making in terms of uh, new ways of using the tools, new ways of doing design? Um, you know, and, and uh, there's a sort of thing that happens in these uh, immersive environments where there's a sort of initial sort of orientation period where everybody's going, ooh, and ah, I think it's wonderful, and then sort of starts to get a bit more familiar with the technology after you know, quite a short period of time, half an hour or so. And then we found, even though they were just supposed to be just looking at these models and seeing how they looked, they started to kind of start doing design work. They started to sort of uh, challenge whether the sink heights were right or uh, whether um, grab rails were in the right place. Uh, they started to pretend to be patients and doctors and nurses in this immersive environment, pretending to stand under the shower in the ensuite bathroom and things like that. They started to sort of uh, do some rather unexpected things, in fact. And, um, you know, they talked about afterwards how this, you know, was quite a different uh, experience than looking at a 3D model on the computer screen or looking at um, uh, kind of flat 2D kind of stuff. They were doing sort of different things. I mean, you, can, you can look around, you can look at the bed, you can stand at the nurse's station in, in, in the model and you can peer around and see how far you can see down the corridor and into the, into the single rooms. Uh, 
you know, and, and they talked, and we talked to them about how this gives you this sort of potential for a new, new way almost of, of, of exploring how space can be used, exploring how you can refine uh, design through engaging in these sort of virtual spaces uh, to be able to make a, uh, a better kind of outcome. And in fact, we've got some uh, work just starting um, in Denmark uh, with uh, some Danish hospitals that are um, being built and they're very interested in trying to build a hospital that looks a bit different from normal uh, standard hospitals and try to use this technology to work through new working practices, new clinical practices and how uh, we, can, we can sort of use different types of spaces, different layouts and designs to support that. But it also hints at, at you know, an entire kind of set of new work practices in these kind of spaces. Um, it's, it, it doesn't, uh, I think you might say it on the next slide even, it doesn't just add something else, you have paper and we have 2D and we have 3D and we have models and whatever, it kind of did something else, it seemed to challenge these people's view of the design that they were very familiar with because they kind of made it, it sort of seemed to do something else, this, uh, this immersive technology that was kind of quite interesting. You know, certainly we see these new technologies as not replacing paper, say. The idea of paperless kind of processes, you know, just, I don't think, going to happen. Um, but this idea that it kind of challenges as well as enhances is quite an interesting one in terms of how these sort of technologies uh, can be uh, incorporated into, uh, into practices. So, okay, that was uh, more or less it. I mean, we've got lots of things going on, and I know uh, Jennifer talked about some of her work, and I hope you have an impression we've got lots of exciting stuff going on at Reading in this, uh, uh, this space around sort of technology and organisation. Uh, we're still carrying on more stuff with using the immersive environments uh, and, and the role of using these sort of technologies to try to develop new kinds of innovative spaces, for instance, in healthcare, uh, as I just said. Uh, we've got a project ongoing that's trying to align the different sets of standards that you get around uh, construction work. So this is working with quantity surveyors, as estimators that have their own new rules of measurement, their own system of kind of uh, costing things, trying to align that with the kind of emerging BIM standards, uh, PAS 1192 and so on, which is interesting. Uh, we've got an interesting project which is trying to do a, um, using very cheap and available technology, try to make a virtual museum uh, that uh, the, the project came from our university museums, closing for a year for refurbishment, and they wanted to have a sort of virtual representation on, uh, available for people to sort of virtually visit. Um, and that's been effectively transporting some of the kind of big construction technologies into this idea of, of, of making kind of representations of public spaces, which is kind of interesting. Um, stuff around trying to lock together the kind of functional and, and spatial data of sort of BIM models and, and sort of uh, building management systems with kind of financial data, uh, working with a whole bunch of big UK clients on that. Um, and another sort of new interest, which is this idea of you know, the mandate being, the big mandate being sort of quasi regulations, not quite regulations throughout the sector. Um, but we're seeing this providing opportunities for some companies, uh, but also smaller companies uh, in more regional uh, areas. So sort of starting to fall out of the picture because they can't either afford or have the capacity to pick up some of these new modelling technologies to stay part of, for instance, local councils and frameworks and so on. So, uh, very final slide with three minutes to go. Lots of exciting stuff going on. Yeah, lots of stuff happening. The government push is really having an impact in the UK. People are talking about it. People are doing it. Uh, but actually, the sector, kind of sectoral level of implementation is, you know, somewhere behind what you might think from the kind of level of discussion. Uh, sometimes the improvement rhetoric and the, the, the kind of technical stuff runs away from the realities of how you support, you know, what that something else is to make BIM implementation and use happen. Uh, happen. And again, I think the big issue we have is as all these emerging practices kind of come around, uh, they all go off in different directions. And as we then want to scale up, the government wants us to work in a kind of standard way, it becomes very difficult to pull all these 
different emergent ways of using the technology back together into a consistent kind of space, which is where that kind of contest between emergence, between, between uh, spinning out these new ways of using and the idea of you know, scaling up uh, to a higher level, higher level of use of these uh, kinds of practices. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>